Well, as we get started tonight, uh, I wanted to start by sharing a personal prayer request that I have. Uh, as much as I can, I want to be open and honest, um, and this is something that I have a lot of people praying for, uh, and so I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so I'm going skydiving this next weekend, okay, and uh, I'm very excited about it. Zach back there in the tech booth, he's going skydiving with me. Robin is not going, but her husband is going. Uh, and we're super pumped. We are uh, freaking out a little bit about it, but we are super excited for it. Uh, and so if you, you know, remember this on Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, just pray for us. It'll be probably around 12 or 1 in the afternoon that we're jumping out of a plane. Uh, maybe set a reminder on your phone if you really want to, but uh, we could use some prayers um, next Saturday. So I just wanted to share that. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight, uh, but I just want to let you guys know that that's going on. Uh, but we're going to be continuing in our series tonight called Upside Down. Okay, so if you uh, weren't here last week or you don't know what this is, Upside Down, what we're doing this summer uh, is we are going through the Beatitudes. Okay, and so uh, what Jesus does here in the Beatitudes is, is he really just flips the disciples' world upside down. But more than that, really what he's doing is he's taking the, the social norm, basically what was accepted for the way that everyone lived and everyone was expected to live, and what he does is he flips it on its head. Okay, and so he gives us a, a new and a different way to live. He gives us these kingdom attitudes that we are to live out and really embody if we want to be a part of his kingdom. Last week was Matthew 5, 3, and it talked about uh, how blessed are the poor in spirit. And tonight is Matthew 5, verse 4, and it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And very similar to last week, the way I want to start is just by defining some of these terms in this verse Okay, because uh, the Bible was not originally written in English, and so we have to make sure that um, we understand the original intent and, and what the author was really trying to say, and sometimes it doesn't translate the best. And so we want to um, define some of these terms before we really get into it. And so the first one that I wanted to define is blessed. Okay, this is something I probably should have defined last week, but I didn't. Uh, but it's in every single beatitude. Okay, so the rest of the summer, this is going to come up a lot. But blessed, uh, it's, this word, it's more than being happy. Really what this word means is experiencing uh, hope or joy. Okay, so it's like a, a deep level of hope and joy that we get to experience. Comforted, uh, really what that word means um, is to be encouraged or strengthened. Okay, so in this verse, uh, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn for they will... Uh, be encouraged or be given strength. They'll be strengthened. But the word that I want to spend more time on tonight is mourn, okay? Because that's what really this verse is all about. It's probably not a, a word that we typically think about or use a lot. Uh, and so this word mourn, really what this means is to lament or to feel guilt, okay? So if you were there uh, at church this morning, Pastor Chris talked a little bit about uh, lamenting and what that is. Uh, but this word mourn means to lament or to feel guilt. But this word mourn is, is not what we probably typically uh, think that it is. So this word mourn does not mean uh, the feeling that you have or what you go through, say, if you uh, lose a family member. If someone in your family passes away, you, you mourn and, and you grieve because of that. That's not what this word means. That's not what this beatitude means. What this, this word means for this verse uh, is actually all about sin. Okay, and so what this verse is saying is that if you are mourning, then you are lamenting, you're, you're feeling deep sorrow or grief or guilt or regret because of the sin that you either have in your life or the sin around the world. It's when you recognize sin and, and you hate it. You don't want that sin in your life. You, you don't want it to be a part of who you are. You don't want it to be uh, anything to have to do with yourself. You, you don't want it to be in your life. You hate the sin that you see. I kind of compare it to uh, a similar moment when you do something and like right when you do it, you know that you shouldn't have done that and maybe you get like this, this gut feeling inside of you of just like regret and wishing that you could take that back. It's kind of like that, but just on a, a completely bigger uh, level. So I want to go back to the, the main verse because the question is how, how does this verse make sense based on all of that? Okay, so it's saying that uh, we're going to experience hope and joy when we are broken and grieving because of our sin, and not only that, but we're also going to be encouraged and strengthened. Okay, how in the world do all of those things go together? How, how does that make sense? Well, we can experience those things, the, the joy, the hope, the strength, the comfort, all of those things. We can experience those things because in the moments, um, because in those moments when we're mourning over our sin, 
That's when we get to experience God's faithfulness and the way that he forgives and cleanses us of our sins. When we are deep in our sin, that is when we have the opportunity to experience God's grace on a deeper level. When we mourn over our sin, when we allow our sin to push us closer to God, that is when we get to experience the grace of God. Okay, so think about it in terms of this. Uh, how many of you in here have ever had a missing assignment? Or you didn't turn in, a, turn in something in school? Okay, so uh, my guess is almost all of us, there might be some in here that have never had a missing assignment. Uh, but imagine you, you go to class, right? And at the beginning of class, the teacher makes a comment about uh, the, the assignment that you're supposed to do, or maybe that you have like a quiz. And uh, right when they say that, you know that you totally space doing this homework assignment. I was a pretty good student in high school and college, but there were a couple times when this happened, and, and I don't know about you, but I had like this distinct feeling inside of me when I'm sitting there and I, I didn't do the homework. I didn't know that we had it, and the teacher's like, all right, pass up your homework. There's just like, my stomach just dropped. I was like, oh, all right, I screwed up, right? And I could just like feel it on the inside. Now imagine you're in that situation, and the teacher looks out, and they see that you're shocked, and some other people completely forgot. They can just see it on your face, and the teacher decides to give you an extension, Okay, so the teacher says, all right, you actually have until next class period to get that assignment turned in. Well, in that moment, who do you think is going to be most excited? I'm going to be, right? The people that had their work done and, and were prepared, they're probably not going to be super thrilled about it. But me, whoever didn't have the assignment done, they're going to be super excited about it because they needed that extra time to get it in. And the same is true in our relationship with God. When we screw up, when we make mistakes, when we do all the wrong things, how thankful and comforted are we in those moments when we get to experience God's love and his forgiveness? Because when our sin is great, that's when God's grace is even greater. Romans 5.20 talks about that. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about this idea and what this looks like, but uh, tonight is going to be a little bit different than a typical message. What I want to do, instead of just explaining this verse and and uh, explaining it in different ways and talking about it, I want to show you what this actually looks like. Okay, and one of the best examples that I could find in Scripture of this verse being played out, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. One of the best examples that I could find is actually King David. Okay, and so uh, I I'm going to summarize a story from King David's life. It comes from 2 Samuel 11. I'm not going to read the story. This is going to be like a 15, 20 second spark notes version of this story. You might be familiar with it, but basically what happens uh, is that King David has an affair with a girl named Bathsheba. Bathsheba's married to a guy named Uriah. Uriah's off fighting in war. King David has an affair with her. Bathsheba ends up getting pregnant. King David, to try to cover all this up, he brings Uriah back off the battlefield and, and he tries to basically get Uriah to sleep with his wife so that uh, they'll think that it was Uriah's baby and not his baby. Well, that doesn't work. Uriah doesn't do that uh, because he wants to, to stay committed to the people that are fighting the battle. And so King David has Uriah killed. Okay, and that's like the 22nd version of that story. Okay, go read it, 2 Samuel 11. It's, it's a crazy story. But what I want to do is I want to look at uh, David's response to what happens. Okay, so I want to look at how David responds to this sin that he has in his life. And where I want to start is Psalm 51. Okay, Pastor Chris read a little bit of this this morning, uh, but Psalm 51 is where David is mourning over his sin. Okay, this is shortly after uh, he would have committed these different sins, and now David is, is mourning over these sins. He is broken over his sins, and he goes to God because of them. And, and they're not going to be on the screen because it's a really long uh, passage, but I just want you to listen. As you listen, just listen to the, the, the grief, the sorrow, the mourning uh, the brokenness that David is experiencing as he writes these words. Okay, Psalm 51. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. 
Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. And so David, he is completely broken because of his sin. You can sense his his deep level of of regret and guilt and sorrow that he has because of the sin that he's committed. He, He absolutely hated what he did. And I don't know about you, but I've been there before. Right, I've been in a, a moment like that. I've been in that place where I've sinned and I've messed up, and I, frankly, I've just hated myself for it. And I've thought to myself, what am I going to do? What am I going to do now? And this is where David was when he wrote Psalm 51. But now I want to read Psalm 32. Okay, and so this is important to note. The Psalms, they were not written in, in chronological order, so they're not in the way that they were written. Um, And so Psalm 32 is actually the psalm that most scholars believe would have been the next psalm that David would have written. Okay, so he wrote Psalm 51, and then the next one, uh, or one of the next ones right after that, would have been this psalm, Psalm 32. And what I want you to notice as you listen is the change uh, in tone and mood, just the, the stark difference between the two psalms. Okay, so that first one is the first half of that, the beatitude that we're talking about, right? Blessed are those who mourn. David's mourning in Psalm 51, Psalm 32, he's receiving comfort. He's being blessed. Okay, so listen to the difference in this. It says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will, conf- I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and brittle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Do you notice the difference? All right, it is a complete 180 complete shift. There's a complete difference in these two psalms, and this is the beatitude perfectly played out in someone's life. This is what it looks like. David, he, he has this great sin. He mourns. He, he grieves. He, he regrets it. He has this uh, sorrow because of it. He's broken because of it. He allows that sin to push him closer to God, and because he goes to God in that, that's when he experiences the, the comfort and the encouragement and the strength that we get when we go to God. David's story in these two Psalms, they perfectly play out what this looks like, but now what I want to do is is give us some some practical things for what this can look like for our life, how we can apply this beatitude for our life. I'm going to quickly touch on these, and this is going to be uh, mostly what you're going to talk about and discuss in your small group time. But the first thing that I want to say is that we have to recognize sin for what it is. Okay, if we're going we're gonna to live out this beatitude, then we have to recognize sin for what it is. And here's what I mean by this. We have to recognize and understand that sin is deadly, that sin is destructive, that sin brings about pain. We have to recognize what sin does. James 1, 14 and 15 says it like this. It says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Sin brings about destruction, pain, death. We have to recognize sin for what it is. We have to recognize that sin is a big deal. Okay, we have to recognize that sin is a big deal. And this should be something that we we easily understand. 
right? As followers of Jesus, we should easily be able to understand this idea, but the reality is that the, the world that we live in is normalizing sin, okay? The world that we live in is normalizing sin because sin is, is just so common, Everywhere you look, you see sin. We're surrounded by sin. Whether you're at school, whether you're at extracurricular activities, even in your own family, we are surrounded by sin. And so sin is becoming normalized in our world. We don't even see sin for being something that's necessarily bad or wrong a lot of the times because it's, it just is so normal. It's what everyone is doing. Or maybe worse, maybe we're at the point where we're starting, we're starting to tolerate sin. Okay, maybe we don't think it's a big deal, and so we just don't do anything about it. We don't fight against it. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't try to get rid of it. We don't hate it. We don't really care if we sin or not. And we get to the point where maybe sin's just not such a bad thing after all. My fear is that we have completely normalized sin or we tolerate sin because we don't recognize sin for what it is. And why that's important is because if, if we don't recognize the weight of sin and we don't recognize sin for what it is, the, the destructiveness and, and the pain and the damage and the death, if we don't recognize those things, then we're never going to get to the point where we live out this beatitude. Because if we don't see sin for what it is, then we're never going to mourn over it or grieve over it or, or, or hate it. But my fear is the world that we live in is, is normalizing it and, and we're tolerating it. Here's something else that I want to say uh, before we move on from this point. Something that we have to understand about sin is that sin is, is never a private or a personal thing. Okay, oftentimes we think that the sins that we commit, we think that uh, they're private or they're personal or, or uh, no one knows about them or uh, they're just us, right? They're just affecting us. But the reality is there's no such thing as, as sin that only affects us. Every single sin that we commit is going to affect other people. The people you're in relationships with, your friends, your families. Sin is, is not a personal or a private thing. Okay? It's, it always affects the people around us. We have to recognize sin for what it is. The second idea that uh, I want to talk about, and we really see this in uh, David's story, is that we have to allow our sin to push us closer to God. Okay, David, uh, he, he kind of goes through this journey and there's a point in David's life when he actually uh, doesn't go to God after this sin. And, and there's a cool story there. But uh, we see David kind of explain this in verses 3 through 5 of Psalm 32 that I read. He said, When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But finally I confessed all my sins to you and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me, and all my guilt is gone. And so David, like I said, he had this period of his life where he, he didn't go to God about it, right? And I, I think that we all have probably been there where we've sinned and we've messed up and, and, and we felt dirty or we've <clears throat> we felt wrong, and, and we might not even, we might have felt like we couldn't go to God, like we were scared to go to God or, or we were so dirty and, and sinful that we didn't want to go to God. But in those moments, we have to be reminded of the gospel, and we have to remember what Romans 5, 8 says, that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if we remember that verse, we're reminded that God's love is not dependent on what we do, whether we're doing well or, or whether we're sinning. Wherever we are on, on our, our spiritual walk or our spiritual scale, our, God's love for us is not dependent on those things, but it's dependent on the fact that he just loves us. While we are still sinners, he loves us. But we have to allow our sin to push us closer to God. And really what this looks like in our lives, the practicality behind this is confession and repentance. Okay, and this is something that you're going to talk about uh, in your groups. But we have to confess our sins to God and then repent from them. Um, 1 John 1, 9. It says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. The comfort and the blessedness that our main verse talks, to, talks about tonight is all because of the gospel. Okay, it's only because of God's love for us and his grace for us that we can be blessed while we're, while we're feeling broken because of our sin. And uh, here's my last idea, the bottom line, something that you're going to talk about in groups, is that 
as disciples of Jesus, remember the Beatitudes are kingdom attitudes, things that we're supposed to be living out as disciples of Jesus. As disciples of Jesus, we have to get to the point where we truly love what God loves and we hate what God hates. We have to get to the point where we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. And so my question is, do you hate sin or have you normalized or are you tolerating sin in your life? We have to love what God loves and hate what God hates. This comes from recognizing what sin truly is. But even in our sin, it's not losing sight of the gospel and the truth that where our sin is great, that's where God's grace is even greater. 